Hello, it's Scott Manley here with another visit to NASA Ames Research Center. We did this after open source with a bunch of other creators, and when we saw this, we had one question. This is all 100% grounded? It is 100% grounded and safe, yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm just sitting around this I don't want to walk any closer. Come on. So as many of you will have already guessed, this is a massive capacitor bank. Each row has nine of these large capacitors. There are five rows in each rack, and there are four racks. This massive system was built in the 1960s for NASA's Electric Arc Shock Tube, or EAST facility. This is used to generate shocks in planetary atmospheres so that they can model re-entry physics. Originally, it was a one megajoule capacitor bank, which consisted of all the rows except the top one. Of course, that wasn't enough energy. With the addition of that top row on, on, the, on the whole capacitor bank, the uh, the rating went from 1 megajoule to 1.25 megajoules of uh, energy. Like I said, original original design from the 1960s that still works today. So this is used to drive the shock tube facility. And what a shock tube is, is you've got high pressure gas on one side, low pressure gas on the other, and then there's a wall separating them. And then if you remove that wall really quickly, it generates a shock wave which travels down and you can study it. And so what the electric shock tube does is the high pressure section has a giant lightning bolt zapped into it to make it super hot and therefore generating a very powerful shock wave. So there's basically a bunch of cables that run over the wall into this little gizmo in the other room. So this is the driver section of the shock tube. But they basically take all that electrical power and dump it into the gas. The gas, which is usually something like helium, gets super hot, very likely hotter than the surface of the sun, and then expands through a rupture disc. And as it does so, it generates a high velocity shock wave in the test gas next door. How fast? Well, the top speed of this tunnel is something like 48 kilometers per second. And as you can imagine, when you hit a gas that hard, it literally smashes electrons off the atoms. It generates ions, generates light, generates heat, and all that stuff produces light, which tells us what's going on. So why is NASA interested in this kind of stuff? Well, you might remember these images from the hypervelocity free flight aerodynamic facility where you see a test projectile generating a shock wave as it moves through the gas. Now, what you'll notice is that shock wave is not actually touching the surface of the object. And that's good because the shock wave is much, much hotter than the gas in front or behind it. That's why re-entry vehicles have blunt bodies to keep this very hot shock wave away from the surface. But that shock wave is hot and it's generating light and that light will heat the surface of the heat shield. And how much light a shock generates in a gas very strongly depends upon the chemistry of the gas. The, the ionization, the chemical reactions, all that stuff needs to be understood before you send a heat shield through an atmosphere. There are very likely to be significant differences between the radiative heating of a spacecraft entering Earth versus Mars. And so this allows them to generate those re-entry style shock waves in whatever atmosphere they want. And when we were visiting them, they were doing research on the atmosphere of Titan, nitrogen and methane. And this was, of course, in support of the Dragonfly mission, the ambitious NASA mission that hopes to put a nuclear-powered flying robot on a moon of Saturn. And this visit had been set up in such a way that we could experience a test in the same way that they experienced a test. And, well, they did it through this very old control panel. Again, most of the hardware which is running this was developed and built in the 1960s, and there wasn't necessarily a need to change a lot of that. Now, on the sensor side, the cameras, the spectrometers, and everything else, there's a lot of improvements there. But considering the energies and the pressures involved, the test was somewhat anticlimactic. It was basically just setting everything up. One of the things you have to do is lock all the doors, take each of the keys, and you need all those keys to lock the, the lock down the facility to get the firing key that you can put on the control panel. Once you have that, you're pretty much just waiting on the charge to build up, and once it reaches the magic set number, there's a bit of a bang, and that's it. But that's kind of what you want. You have this incredible energy and fury, but you need it to be contained so that you can understand it. And then unlike the 60s, moments later, we are able to observe the spectra that they have gathered from this particular test. 
This shows where the gas will seat up and shine when a spacecraft is flying through that atmosphere at super orbital speeds. It's kind of hard to figure out what's going on with this terrible video image I have. Thankfully, they do in fact publish scientific papers, so here's one they made earlier. And by coincidence, this is also for an atmosphere with methane and nitrogen. So what I want you to look at is along the bottom of each of these graphs, you've got a wavelength in angstroms, right? So angstroms just like one tenth of a nanometer. But the thing is, that's your standard spectrum. But on the vertical axis, you have distance. So the imaging system is actually looking at the shock wave as it passes from the side. It can see where the front is, but they can also see it has a finite thickness. As the shockwave passes, the gas is relaxing back to a lower energy state and emitting light as it does so. So they're set up to get a slice through this shockwave. So all the sensors that do that are in the test section at the far end of the tube. The driver section is up here and the power supply, that massive capacitor, is over the wall off beyond the top right of the screen here. Now the facility also includes a narrower tunnel which is better for higher pressures. There's a vacuum tank that can be used as an expansion tank if you want to have the shockwave flow out the end or you can just blank that off and have the shockwave reflect if you want to get more powerful shocks at the expense of harder time analysing your results. So let's go through this with in sequence. We've already seen some of the capacitor, but there's a few more details which are, I want to share. First of all, those white rods sticking out, those are actually giant fuses that can take individual capacitors out of the array if necessary. Those brown metal strips along the front, those aren't structural. Those are the conductors. That's what carries the current out of these. These, as a bank, they can generate something like a million amps. The conductors need to be that thick. If there's a problem and they have to shut the system down, they need a place where they can dump all that energy, so they have this big resistor array. Obviously that's going to get hot. If you dump a megajoule into this, it needs like a whole hour to cool down again. But assuming everything goes correctly, then you will ideally be dumping all that electrical energy into the driver gas. And there's a bunch of different uh, configurations for this, but this is one example, the conical driver that they were using. And of course, they had examples of all this stuff laid out on a table for us to take a look at. So here, what he's explaining is how they initiate the initial spark. So you have to understand at the top, there is an electrode and at the bottom, there is an electrode and there's a 30,000 volt difference between them. How do you connect those? Well, it's quite simple. If you look in the middle there, that electrode has a white piece of string coming out of it and it's Almost impossible to see, but that is attached to a very, very thin tungsten wire. When the correct voltage is reached, there is a piston on the other side of that electrode which pulls that string. And once it gets close enough to that electrode, that entire capacitor bank is going to be dumping a million amps through that very, very thin tungsten wire. I, I don't know how long it lasts, but I'm sure its life is measured in nanoseconds. But as it turns to plasma, that creates a conductive path for the arc to continue for a very short time and, of course, heat all the gas in there. Now, look at the volume there. Imagine you filled that with your driver gas. There's only a few liters there. So it's really you're measuring the amount of gas that you're heating in grams. 1.25 megajoules is equivalent to maybe a third of a kilogram of TNT in terms of energy. But you're putting it into just a few grams of gas. That's why it gets so ridiculously hot and high pressure. That's what it looks like after a few firings. Obviously, it's blackened because it's getting very hot, but some of that is probably just a tungsten vapor that has deposited on the surface. On the table, you can see the burst disk there on the right and a burst disk holder. And behind it, you can see a pair of tubes. Those are different drivers that uh, use more gas and therefore produce lower velocity shocks. And again, that's another configuration change they can make depending upon the requirements for the experiment. As I said, there are two tunnels. They are currently using the larger one. And the larger one is actually a relatively recent build. The larger tunnels give improved testing time at lower pressures and densities. But they built one of these in the 1970s. The problem was that it didn't perform as well as they expected. And I think it was down to some uh, ir irregularities on the interior. So I think this tunnel the 60 centimeter tunnel was built in the last uh, decade or so, and that required uh, some serious work in the fabrication. Um, interesting fact about the shock tube is it started out as a flat plate. 
it was actually rolled. You can see some of the roll marks here to basically go from a flat play into a, into a circle. Also, it has a full penetration weld because it's, it's a vacuum chamber as well. So we, we, uh, we pumped it up to like 10 to the minus 6 uh, torque uh, to get all the impurities out before we do a shock tube test. Um, so, so there's a full penetration weld that goes along uh, every tube section and every port. For example, this is one of the welds here. Uh, goes over. So, fun fact, when, when they welded this, to get a full penetration weld, you actually have to weld it from the inside out. So there was somebody in the shock tube welding while the outside of it is being preheated to 100 degrees Fahrenheit. 100 degrees C, sorry, 100 degrees C. Of course, they have they have the proper PPE, so that exactly. <laughs> what but is the proper PPE? I, I, I don't know. I've got to be in Break, the cooling garment. Test, or during the acceptance testing, I met the welder that, that did this job, and he, and he pulled me aside and he said, I, I never want to see this thing again. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that does not sound fun. Anyway, we get to the far end, and this is the instrument stack. These are all the spectrometers that work in various different wavelengths to observe the shock wave as it passes, or as it actually reflects off the end here. Because it's reflecting, it kind of doubles back on itself, giving it a more powerful shock, but there's drawbacks to that in terms of data processing. So they have instrumentation boxes on both sides of the tunnel, and they sit on these roll out boxes which they will typically evacuate because they want to remove any signature from the regular atmosphere around us. So this is an example I found, it may not be the example they were using, but if you look in the bottom left and go clockwise you get to in, uh, shorter and shorter wavelengths. So in the bottom you've got uh, infrared, the near infrared, top left you have visible near infrared, Top right is UV and visible, and in the bottom right is vacuum ultraviolet. That's the frequencies of the ultraviolet that would typically be absorbed by the regular atmosphere. So anyway, each of these boxes interface to the tube with a, like a flange system that uh, connects them to a very long and thin window. And this is, of course, because they're trying to image the thickness of the shock, right? They're trying to get what's happening at the very front and as they we progress backwards, how it changes. This window provides a viewing area of about 12 centimeters. And consider that if you have a microsecond shutter, a seven kilometer per second shock is gonna move seven millimeters in that time, which is, you know, a decent chunk of that window. Also consider that as the shock wave is traveling down this tunnel, they need to know where it is so that they can correctly trigger their spectrometers at the right time. So there's actually a series of sensors that are measuring not just the velocity, but the shape. They're trying to make sure that it isn't moving at an angle going down that tube. Another thing that they need to account for is that the driver gas that is creating this shock wave, it is pretty much chasing that shock wave along down that uh, tunnel. So they want to make sure that they're not going to get information or not going to use spectra that have come from the, the arc. And so typically a few centimeters behind that initial shock front, again, moving at multiple kilometers per second, you start to see spectral lines for things like aluminium and tungsten. And that is the sign that you've gone from being the good atmosphere gas to the contaminated gas. And I believe that as you go to the wider tunnels, these lines, these distances get further apart. So that's one of the reasons why you go for the wide tunnel. One of the things they keep around when they're testing is the burst disks that have been used during a test series. And they write the test number and everything on it. If chunks are missing, that might be interesting to them. So on the other side of the lab, they do have the smaller shock tube here. This is the fastest shock tube in the world, right? When you fill this with, say, hydrogen, they've been able to generate shocks that go down that at 48 kilometers per second. That's the kind of thing that you're going to use for testing atmospheric entry into the gas giants. Remember, NASA Ames was instrumental in developing the heat shield for the Galileo probe, which I believe entered Jupiter's atmosphere at something like 60 kilometers per second. But you can see that it has the same interface for the same optical tables. They just move them over from the other side uh, and attach them in the same location. It does pretty much the same stuff, but it is designed for higher pressures. They also have the ability to mount a wind tunnel section on the back. If you need to test out your models in wind tunnels at these ridiculous velocities. 
Again, by switching stuff up, they are able to cover a very wide range of pressures, velocities, and atmospheric compositions with the two different tunnels they have. And this kind of data is all really important for building the best heat shields for your mission. There's a saying that uh, anyone can build a bridge, but it takes an engineer to barely build a bridge. And this is absolutely the case with heat shields, right? You could overbuild your heat shield to be sure that it will handle the target atmosphere and velocity and everything. Getting this kind of information removes uncertainties. And by removing uncertainties, you can move your margins back closer to the most efficient heat shield design. You can save mass on your spacecraft design and by extension, make your mission more cost effective, either by having more instrumentation or using a smaller launch vehicle. And so I want to end on the heat shield that everyone's talking about. Take a look at that big marshmallow looking thing there. What that is, is a cleaner. They put that down the tube to basically clean deposits off the walls. When you dump a lot of energy into a gas, which is a mixture of different atoms, you're going to get all sorts of interesting molecules created, and some of those will stick to the walls. Sure, you're going to have things like aluminium, tungsten, plastics, all sorts of stuff is going to get down there and have to be cleaned. But it's been pointed out that uh, the atmosphere of Titan is orange. And that's because of molecules that form a chemical smog. Molecules are formed by uh, molecular nitrogen and methane being bombarded with high energetic you know, cosmic rays, ultraviolet, which causes them to disassociate and recombine into new and interesting mo molecules, which are orange. And the same process can happen between methane and nitrogen in you know highly shocked atmospheric entry conditions. So now imagine there's a spacecraft that is talking about transpiration cooling its heat shield by flowing methane through it as it enters into the Earth's atmosphere, which is 80% nitrogen. Do you think that same kind of orange stuff could end up being produced? I mean, sure, the official word from Elon right now is that this uh, orange deposit is formed from iron oxide from the metallic tiles. But, uh, you know, we haven't really seen this up close, so I wouldn't be surprised if there's an alternate explanation. I'm Scott Manley, fly safe. Oh, but wait, before we go to music, I kind of want to give a shout out to my supporters at Patreon, which uh, has become a little more important to me in the last month. I really appreciate their support, and this video is going to be available early to any supporters that want to check it out.